Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 289 for the 11th of Elul in a leap year. So those of you that know me a little bit beyond this podcast most likely know that I have a fascination with personality type systems. Some are better than others, for sure. And the two that I tend to gravitate to the most and that I have found to be the most insightful from my own life is the system of the Enneagram and the Myers-Briggs personality type system, which is somewhat loosely based on Carl Jung's psychology. But now the thing is, what I find fascinating about these personality type systems, and I'm going to talk about those two in particular for right now, is actually beyond when you get beyond the superficial aspects of it. So it actually kind of irks me sometimes when people talk about either the Enneagram or the Myers-Briggs system, and they when they present the personality types, they kind of present them in this caricaturized kind of way. That was actually what turned me off initially from the Enneagram, was uh, the first book that I ever was uh, was recommended to read about it did this very thing. It really took the types and it presented them in this very caricaturized kind of way to the point that I actually mistyped myself because the way they presented my my real type was just so like extreme and just didn't really speak to me. Um, and for Myers-Briggs as well, it's like there's a way to to explain the types in this very superficial way, but then there's a deeper way to look at it. The, the, what, what am I talking about in terms of the deeper way? Well, in the Enneagram, the way it works, those of you that aren't so familiar, is you have your core type. So I'm a core type three, for example, and I'm not going to get into the whole thing today because that would take too long. Maybe another episode I'll do that. But um, but my core type is three, which is motivated by success and image and all of that. But then in addition to being a core type three, I have a wing and the wing is a four wing. That is what is what is the type four? The four is the spiritual person, the individualist, the creative, the sensitive person. So these two sides might sound like polar opposites, like one person um, on the one hand being somebody who's very driven and very successful and very into their image. And on the other hand, they have this other side of them, this wing side of them that is a that is actually um into being an individual, being real, being authentic, being spiritual, looking beyond the superficial, right? Then there's also the points of integration, the points of disintegration, and that also adds complexity to the individual. Uh, So I think that's really interesting. And I think that that actually is where the system can be really useful is when you look at a person, not just in terms of their core number, but you look at them in terms of what's going on behind the scenes. What else is there besides what you just see at first glance? Myers-Briggs is the same thing. So again, I'll use myself because it's the easiest example. So in the Myers-Briggs personality type system, I'm an INTJ, which those of you who are familiar with the system, the stereotype of the INTJ, the kind of like, again, caricature of the INTJ is this very robotic kind of like almost um, autistic (laughs) to the point kind of person. Uh, Like some famous INTJs are Mark Zuckerberg, Ayn Rand, Elon Musk actually is an INTJ. So it's like a very, you know, kind of um, engineer, computer-y kind of person who's very logical and that kind of thing. But now the thing is that gets interesting with Myers-Briggs as well is there's something called the functions. And the functions is, again, just like kind of like that wing or the points of integration and disintegration that you find in the Enneagram, the, the, the functions are what's going on behind the surface. There's sort of like the, the underlying like behind the scenes kind of thing. So for an INTJ, for example, their primary uh, function is introverted intuition, which is 
okay, maybe you can say that still kind of could be somewhat brainy-ish, but it's not so much. It's, it's a little bit more subtle. It's a little bit more spiritual, kind of like intuition isn't something. It's a little bit more abstract than that. The second function of the INTJ is the extroverted thinking part, which is all about teaching and everything, which kind of makes sense in terms of my podcast that we're very good at, at explaining ideas and that kind of thing. The third function and the fourth function is where it gets extra interesting is the third function for an INTJ is an introverted feeler. So actually unknown to many people, uh, INTJs actually, while they may appear very uh, logical on the surface and very brainy and almost stoic kind of like they're kind of um, famous for not showing too many expressions, not being overly effusive with their emotions and that kind of thing. They actually have very, very deep emotions. That's the introverted feeling part. And then the last function, which I also find really fascinating is extroverted sensing, which is all about just uh, being really indulgent in physical reality, being very physical, being very sensory and that kind of thing, which I think for me could be, could explain kind of my obsession with contortion and yoga and that kind of thing. And you'll often find this with many INTJs that they're very athletic or they're very into some kind of like physical discipline. So anyways, why am I going off on this whole tangent about Myers-Briggs and the Enneagram and all that? Aside from the fact that I just find it really interesting, and again, what I find interesting about it is getting beyond the superficial, but actually looking at what's happening underneath the surface is that this is actually going to parallel what we're going to learn about in Tanya today, because in Tanya too, it talks about different types of people. It's, it gets deeper than just simple personality types, because when it comes to personality types, we can talk about, okay, is it nature? Is it nurture? Is this how much of our personality type is, was shaped by our early childhood experiences? How much of it was shaped by um, our DNA, by our upbringing, different things that happened to us, you know, things like that. But in Tanya, we're actually going to talk about different types of people in terms of their soul root. And the ultra Rebbe, Rebbe is going and explain to us that there are two main categories of people, uh, two main categories of Jews in terms of their soul root. What are these two categories? Category number one is a chassid kind of person, person who a person whose soul root is in chassid. And category two is a person whose soul root is in gevora. So what does this mean and how does it manifest? So somebody who is, so whose soul root is rooted in chesed. So if you've been following along the, pod, the podcast, you know by now that chesed is all about giving, kindness, it's overflowing, it's kind of uh, extroverted energy, it's it's uh, outpouring, it's, it's expansive is the best way that we can think about it. So this is the type of person who in terms of their service of God, they're going to be very expansive in terms of it. They're not going to be so detail oriented necessarily. They're not necessarily going to be the quietest person in the room. They're the type of person who's going to give a lot of tzedakah. They're going to do everything with a bang. They might go over and above the letter of the law, like buy like tons of food for Shabbos, like way more, you know, get that extra, extra meat, you know, the best wine all that kind of stuff. Invite tons of guests, that kind of thing. Okay, so that sounds pretty good, right? So what about the Gvora person? What's the Gvora person, the, the source of the Gvora person? So we know that Gvora we spoke about is this whole idea of constriction, restriction, maybe judgy a little bit, like judgment oriented. Um, so, okay, that sounds pretty negative, right? But it's not really so negative because somebody who comes from Gvora, the great thing about them is they're going to be the type of person who is actually very meticulous and they're going to make sure to give exactly the right amounts. They're going to be very careful with their accounting, the exact amount to tzedakah. They're going to be very halachically oriented, very check the letter of the law. What time exactly do we go by Rabbeinu Tam? Do we go by this or, you know, whatever in terms of bringing in Shabbos, taking out Shabbos, kashrus, they're going to be so meticulous about it all. And they're actually also, in addition to this, they're actually going to be a very humble and sneeze kind of person, a modest person. So they'll also give tzedakah because according to the letter of the law, you actually have to give quite a good amount of tzedakah, but they're not going to do it with this big bang. They're not going to like make sure that their name is like on all these plaques and stuff like that. If they're just going to give, you know, they're going to give because you're supposed to give and they're going to be careful about making sure that they give a right amount. 
And the ultra rub is going to teach us actually a couple of things. First of all, that both of these are good. It's like th we need both. And actually as Jews, we can't just be satisfied with one or the other, but we actually want to try to become a balanced individual. We want to try to have both aspects of these things within ourselves, within our service of God. The other thing that the ultra rub is going to teach us, which is really fascinating, is that just like Lahavdiel, when it comes to the Enneagram or Myers-Briggs or whatever, there's what you see on the surface of the person of the individual, but then there's stuff going on behind the scenes. And behind the scenes, it turns out that we both, we all have both. So somebody might on the surface seem like a chassid kind of person, that that's their sole root. But in fact, there is a hidden part of themselves that is gvura. There's a hidden gvura to them. And so too, when it comes to gvura, the, their manifest identity might be gvura, but the hidden part of themselves is chassid. The biggest example of this is we see with Avraham of Binu, with Avraham, the, our forefather, his whole thing was all about chassid. His whole life was all about giving, giving. It's like his soul root. He's considered to be the archetype of chassid. However, what do we see about him is the big, the thing that he's most known for is the sacrifice of Isaac, when he actually brought his son, Isaac, to be sacrificed for God, Yitzhak, right? So that's not very chassid kind of thing. That was actually him being really obedient to God in a very, very gvura kind of way. So it was there the whole time, but it just became manifest at that moment. And there are other examples, which the ultra doesn't get into here, where we actually see the chassid within Yitzhak and all of that, um, even though he was the personification, the archetype of Gura. And so all of this, yeah, so all of this is comes, comes to show us that we all have both. We all have our overt side, and then we have the hidden side. We have the inner side of ourselves, which actually, when we say inner, it's actually a misnomer, because as we'll learn, this other shadow part of ourselves is actually more like a shadow that it like hovers around us. It's not found right within ourselves, actually. And so, but the point, the, the emphasis that the ultra rep really wants to bring home here is focusing on the chassad side. It's focusing on the fact that we all have chassad, whether we have it in a, um, and we all are by nature very chassad kind of people. And chassad is all about infinity. So whether we, um, infinite giving, overflowing without measure. So whether we're like this in an overt manner, whether this is like our nature, like in a, just like my overt type is a type three, I'm an INTJ, like, you know, that's like the overt manifestation of who I am, or whether it's there in a, in a shadow manner, meaning it's the hidden traits, the traits that you don't see, but they're still there. And the reason why the ultra pro wants to bring this home is he wants us to recognize the fact that just as we have this infinite level of kindness, this infinite level of chassid within us that we can all, it's just a matter of tapping into, so too does God have an in infinite capacity for chesed. And there's different types of chesed that Hashem uses to manifest himself in the world. There's chesed shal olam that we spoke about previously, the chesed of the world, which is like this more measured kind of chesed. And then there's the rav chesed, which is this infinite kind of chesed. And the ultra rabbi is almost like pleading with God to manifest this. Like it's almost, to me, the way it read, this is maybe just my own um, rendition of it. It sounded to me almost like the ultra rabbi praying it's so much of somewhat of a prayer or somewhat of a of a demonstration to god where he's saying to god look there's you have all these jews all your, your children and they all have this innate chassid within them whether it's overt whether it's covert but it's infinite so thus you too hasham you should re respond with this infinite overflowing chassid as well um without measure but then he does conclude on a the ultra rabbi concludes on a practical note to jews which is that if we want to if once we recognize this once we recognize that we are all infinitely chassid kind of people we want to manifest this how do we manifest it through, once again, the theme of this section, infinite giving, overflowing kindness, without measure, staka, 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 chasad, gmulas chasadim, all of that, just like we've been talking about throughout this epistle. So let's get into it today. Let's get into the text and see how the altar bit explains all of this. And for context, we're going to be learning the entirety of Epistle 13 today. So here we go. So the Altar Rebbe begins, and he actually begins with a, a quote, which is from Tehillim chapter 31, verse 20, where it says, Ma rav tufcha asher tzafanta echa begomer, which means, how abundant is your goodness, which you have hidden away for those who fear you. Uh, and so, okay, so we're going to try to break down that pasuk, which if I'm going to say it again, and in the context of the introduction, maybe you can start to decipher it a little bit on your own. How abundant is your goodness, which you have hidden away for those who fear you. 
Okay, so let's get into the text and try to break it down. So the altar says that in general, when we talk about people who serve God, there are two aspects and two levels that are very that are distinct that are divided in terms of the the root of a person's soul above in a way of right or left meaning to say that the aspect of the left is the aspect of symptom the aspect of constriction and the concealment in the service of god as it says so that is uh that means walk modestly with god your god that's from micha chapter 6 verse 8 and also there's another verse. This one is from Yermiyahu chapter 13, verse 17. That in secret places, my soul weeps. So again, there's something about this like secret places, modest places, uh, being modest, all that stuff. And then now there's a, also the altar but cites a teaching from the Gemara. This is from Moed Katan, page 16b, where it says, um, that anybody who... And I actually looked up the citation and the exact wording is actually kol hosek betol mi bifnim toato mechazet alav mochot. So um, in the, 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 the Gemara says anybody who's involved in Torah study on the inside, meaning in secret, that's the, what the altar was bringing out, then the Torah proclaims on his behalf from the outside. So it's kind of like the idea there's, again, praising this idea of there's something to be said about being modest in your Torah study uh, and being modest in general in your life and your service of God. And so this idea of modesty, so again, we think of contraction, we think of concealment, we think of that stuff as like kind of negative maybe, but in fact, this, there's something very positive about it. The idea of modesty is a very, very great trait and doing things without a huge like hurrah and like needing lots of praise and stuff like that, that is a very big trait. And that also comes from this, this aspect of the symptom, this aspect of the limitation and the constriction in serving God, which is from this place of Gvura. Like for example, when giving staka, a person really thinks about what they're able to, what, uh, you know, what their means will allow them to give. And the, there's that teaching that we learned about previously that comes from the Gemara in Ketuvos, page 50a, where it says, that a person who um, gives charity shouldn't give more than, fifth, than a, a fifth of their income, 20% of their income. So again, it's somebody who's very exacting in terms of what they give, in terms of their tzedakah and things like that. So we see also with like Torah study and other mitzvahs that it's enough for this type of person that they're they they do what they need to do they're they're uh yotze with what they do as according to the letter of the law they set aside special times for Torah city so this is a very firm person this is somebody who's very religious and they set aside these very religious parameters for serving god and from this this is where we also we see reflected in the teachings of our sages and this is a citation from the rambam and in his hilchos talmud torah chapter 4 halacha 5 where it says, cast awe upon your students. So it's like to really educate students to have fear of God. That's the same idea also. So having fear of God is also something very important. Um, so this is all in praise of the left side, the side of Gvorah. Okay, but now what about the right side? The right side is the aspect of chesed and the aspect of expansiveness in terms of serving God with great expansion without any constrictions and without any uh, concealments at all. As, it's, as is, it is written, and this is from Tehillim chapter 119, verse 45, and I will walk about expansively. So there's this other contrasting attribute of walking about expansively without any kind of constriction, any kind of limitation at all. And there's no limitation to the spirit of their giving, whether we're talking about staka, whether we're talking about learning Torah and doing other mitzvahs. So this person isn't like sitting there calculating how much did I give to staka and whatever, how much do I have my set time for learning? They're just like into learning as much as they can. And it's not enough for them to just be yotze, to, to do what they need to do according to the letter of the law, but they want to do it without ends, ad bli die in Hebrew. So just like continue to, to the point of never saying it's enough. And now the altar Rabbi says that every single Jewish person should be made up of these two things. And there's no thing that does not have a place. That's a citation from Pirkei Avos, En Lecha Devalsh En Lomakom, Pirkei Avos chapter 4, verse 3. So meaning there's a time and place for everything. 
And we see, actually, that this is why when we look at the teachings of uh, the very two very famous Torah scholars. There were Shammai and Hillel, and they both had houses of study, and each one was known for something else. So we see, so, so uh, Shammai was known to be very stringent, and Hillel was known to be very lenient. But yet, we do find that there are times when Shammai, Beit Shammai, is lenient, and Beit Hillel is stringent. And th this is in order to teach us that even though Beit Shammai, their source of their souls, definitely came from the supernal left side, and thus they whole, their whole thing, their whole way was to, their orientation was towards uh, being machmir, towards being more stringent always when it came to the forbidden things of the Torah. And Beis Hillel, who they came from the supernal right side, they would be more lenient. They would like look at the positive side to be uh, to be more lenient about these things, to allow things that Be that Beit Shammai didn't allow. And the Altar Rabbi says that they, the reason that they would do this is that they wanted these things to be uh, to be released, the those things that were forbidden to be released, so that they could be elevated above. So we spoke about this idea of the release and the bounds and all that in the earlier section of Tanya in the first part of Tanya, which basically, if we look at the two words mutar and asur, then uh, asur is, comes from the root of being bound, and the word mutar means to be released. So it's like literally by making things um, allowed, this was basically r allowing these, uh, these otherwise bound forces to be released on high. However, nevertheless, even though this was their core root of their soul, that Beit Shammai came from the left side, the side of Gora, Beit Hela came from the right side, the side of Chassad, we do find that there were times that Beit Shammai would be lenient um, due to the fact that their soul also had within it a little aspect of the right side. So this is what we started talking about in the introduction, right? That how everybody, there's the overt what you see, and then there's the behind the scenes what's going on. And so also, same thing, we see that the Beit Hillel also had the left side contained within it. As it's known, when we look at the different attributes above and the holy attributes above, that there's no, um, this is a citation from the Zohar, there's no cleavage or division there, God forbid. So meaning that even that this is a reflection within God, that within God, there's no like chased, I mean, like there is, we talk about that in a certain way, but all of the mitos are actually made up one with the other because there's no real division. And that's why we know that actually like Ultimately, they're actually unified with, with one another, as is known to the students of Kabbalah. So as it is written with Avraham, so we see, again, this idea of Avraham. So Avraham is the whole idea of chasad, right, and love. And then we see that in Bereshish chapter 22, verse 12, where with the story of Akedas Yitzchak, it says, Now I know that you stand in awe of God. So basically, so Avraham, Everybody knew it was apparent that he was a man of chassad, that his whole thing was about chassad. How did this inner aspect of Gvorak become manifest, which is all about fear of God? It's th it was through this, the Akedat Yitzchak, through the bounding of Yitzchak. So this whole thing that he took, bound Yitzchak, his son, and took a knife to sl uh, slaughter his son. He didn't eventually have to go through with it or whatever. But through this, he was actually, Avraham was being vested in the attribute of Gvora. Even though, again, he's overtly chasa, but he was being uh, uh, vested in the attribute of Gvora. So the altar rabbi says, okay, so why is this? We do see this this distinction. So in Yeshayahu chapter 41, verse 8, it says, it, it refers to Avraham as Av, Avraham Ohavai, Avraham my beloved. And then we see about Yitzchak in Breshis chapter 31, verse 20, 42, Pachad Yitzchak, the fear of Yitzchak. So we do see that Avraham is associated with love and Yitzchak is associated with fear. And so the altar rabbi says that the difference between these two things is only by way of revelation and concealment. That in the attribute of Yitzchak, then the fear was in a way of revelation and the love was in a way that was concealed in a way of concealment and um, hiddenness. And the opposite is true when it comes to Avraham, may peace be upon him, shalom, then this is where we can see that this this original pasuk that we started out the section with of marav tufra shel tzafante echa that that was uh, something that David HaMelech said that he that how great is your goodness that you uh, hid for those who fear you. So first, the first part of that pasuk, marav tufra, how great is your goodness, meaning to say how great is your goodness, it has no end. It's it has no measurement. It's really very effusive, and so. 
whether we're talking about those that which you have hidden away for those who fear you or those who are or for those who trust in you so meaning to say so those who fear you are those people who uh, come from the, the left side and those who trust in you are the ones that come from the right side I think those that come from the right side are the ones in which their chesed and their goodness is in a way that is very totally revealed and is very effusive um, before the sight of man so everybody sees it everybody these are the type of people that you look at that whenever people talk about them they're like oh that guy he's such a good guy he's so nice he's so kind he does so much chesed that type of thing and it's not in a way of symptom or concealment at all uh, as it's and and now the ultra just points out a little side note that is kind of interesting where it's if you look at the hebrew where it says lir echa instead of bir echa which lir echa the distinction lir echa means for those who fear you versus bir echa is in those who fear you so when we're talking about the chasad that is found in relation to those people who fear god the verbiage is very exacting it doesn't say bir echa in within those who fear you because it's not within those who fear you it's it's for those who fear you because it's all because anything that it's that is found in a concealed way in the soul teaches the ultra Rabbi, is in a way that it's not actually vested within the body and within the the mind and within the heart but rather it's in a way of makif it's in a way of uh, of surrounding from above like it's a, in a transcendent way and from there it shines within the brain and in the heart and w in those times when it's needed and it needs to become aroused this aspect needs to become aroused uh, and then it, and it needs to become aroused within the mind and within the heart in order to come into actuality and in physical action then it becomes aroused so it's it's there if needed kind of thing it's you know it's it's kind of like on standby but it is outside of the soul it's on in this transcendent way and now the ultra epic goes back to that pasuk which he started off with this marav tufra Israel, that how great is this uh, this abundant goodness for the Jewish people that King David is talking about whether we're talking about it in a concealed way or in a revealed way it's in a way that is beyond measure it's in an infinite way in accordance with the soul of the person that's that's vested within their body meaning to say the point that he's trying to bring home is that whether a Jewish person comes from their soul root is in chesed or whether it comes from gavura it doesn't matter really essentially because it's because the chassad that's found within them is infinite and that their ability to give chassad and what their soul wants to do is to give in an infinite way and so there now the ultra bus says and this is the part where i was like it, it really seems like he's pleading with god is he says so thus with this recogn rec recognition then you too god then you should behave with these people with a way of the of your great chassad without any limitation without any measure which is called rav chassad because as we learned about previously, there's this teaching in the Zohar that there's it chesed, it chesed. there's this type of chesed, and then there's that type of chesed. There's the idea of chesed olam, which is the chesed of the world, which is like a more finite kind of chesed that uh, that has its op opposite attribute, that has the attribute of din, God forbid. That, it, that has the power to come and restrict and constrict the, his chassad and his goodness. But then there's the higher kind of chassad, which is called the rav chassad. This is the great chassad. And there is no attribute of deen that can come and that can limit it and that can constrict it. Um, and that can constrict this great chassad from becoming overflow, overflowing in an infinite way. Because it comes from this place of soviv kolami, and it comes from this place of the surrounding of all the world, and tmira kol tmirin, that which is hidden from all the worlds, which is called keter elion, which is called the supernal crown. And this is why we find in Tehillim, chapter 31, verse 21, tastirem besetr panecha gomer, and then it goes on and it says, Titspinem Basuka. So meaning that uh, that you should hide them from in the concealment of your innermost dimension and con conceal them in a sukkah. So this whole idea of that there's this concealment, it's there's an association with Hashem's great chassad, which is concealed because it's coming from such a high place. And so the altar is kind of calling upon Hashem to reveal this very, very high level of chassad here. Now, a little note, my own little uh, na analysis of this commentary on this take it for what you want this is not from the altar of his own text but it's something that occurred to me in reading this that I found to be very interesting is that the way that the altar describes this higher level of chassad within Hashem is he specifically says that if this level of Hashem this rav chassad within Hashem that is so high that is so so uh, so infinite and all of that it's specifically the level of, uh, of chassad within Hashem that's concealed and that's cr transcendent and that's like kind of like in this hover 
enduring way. So what I find interesting about that is that comes about right about, he explains that right after explaining how those people who are more overtly Gvora by nature, who are more overtly these symptom kind of people, these constricted kind of people, they too have chesed, but their chesed is hidden and it's transcendent. It's hovering above them. So what to me, the, what translates to me like kind of like the logical conclusion from that is that when you look at these people who are very overtly chasek kind of people, like that's great. And we don't want to diminish that. Those people that are very effusive by nature, very outgoing by nature. But what it seems to be implying, if I'm reading this correctly, and those um, anybody who has any thoughts on this, um, please share them in the comments on YouTube. To me, this seems to be saying that those people who are more gvora by nature in an overt way, their level of chassad that they have, because it's actually concealed, because it's actually transcendent, there's actually something greater about it. Just like for Hashem, when we call out Hashem's chassad, the level of chassad within Hashem that is so great is the level that is concealed within him. So that means to say, basically in very practical terms, that when you think of these people, maybe you yourself are one of those people who is more gvora by nature, who is more of the stickler, meticulous, modest, you know, whatever, not only are you not a chassid person, that your chassid actually might be, if I'm reading this correctly, even greater and even more infinite in a certain sense and even have a greater power to it than a person who is more overtly um, chassid by nature. And we see this sometimes with people, that we see this sometimes with the people who we often think of as like these really quiet, kind of like stickler kind of people, very judgmental maybe or something like that but then they'll really come through in this like really amazing way sometimes where it's like the amount of chassad they give the amount of stuck they give when they're there for somebody in need it's like it, it like overpowers it's way more than anybody else you know so i just thought that was interesting to mention um so yeah so that's just something to think about and now the ultra over here is going to conclude with practical advice for in light of all of this and which again is going to point to giving staka so he says after all of this then from the depths of my soul says the ultra about i'm asking to to arouse this hidden um this hidden good that's found hidden in all of the the hearts of all of our chassidim, of everybody. And it should be not hidden anymore, but it should become revealed and it should become practical in action to fill your hands with God, uh, unto God with a, with a full hand and with a very expansive hand with the trusted bearer of this message. Um, and uh, and this and, and this is enough, says the altar bit, for those to understand that which is written in this epistle. And um, I'm not spelling it out, he says, because this isn't necessary. So those who read this should really understand what it is that he's saying and the above will suffice. So perhaps this is the altar is really pointing out what uh, what I mentioned. I don't know, you know, that maybe this whole idea that it's these people who don't feel to be uh, don't feel to have that that overt nature of this giving kind of nature. He's kind of saying that, like, you know, reveal that hidden goodness within you because it's there and and it needs to be revealed and needs to uh, be put out there and give staka. And he says, these are the words of the one who loves you. So so he's coming from love and he's seeking your welfare and uh, your and your health from the heart and this and soulful longing. And then he actually um, signs this letter, which is very uh, interesting because I didn't see this in any of the other epistles that he signs it. He, he signs it Schnell Zalman Ben, the son of my master, my father, uh, my teacher, and my my mentor and my rebbe, Rav Bar, the Harav Rav Baruch. So this is obviously this was like a very very personal epistle that the altar Rebbe wrote to his chassidim, again with the basic message of giving staka. And it my understanding is like the power that he gives here in this giving of staka is really coming from a place of, of recognition that we all have it within us. If you feel like you're not the most generous kind of person by nature, the altar Rebbe is saying on the contrary that you have this deep, deep, deep capacity for giving and it's infinite and you should really tap into that and you should manifest it. So that's it for today and we will continue tomorrow when we begin a new epistle, Epistle 14, and I'll speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Abraham Yitzhak ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, Please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. 
To find out more about the It Is Taught project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.